Boy, I hope I've still got that kind of energy a year after I'm supposed to be dead, don't you? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But you know what he says is right. God's got the final say. <laughs> and um, somebody I was talking with this morning after church, they, uh, they said they didn't know why they were still here. They'd been through this and that and lived through this and that. And the only explanation there is is just God's not done with you. Amen. Until God's done with us, here we'll stay. And each day we get to live, I take it to mean God needs me to do something. And whether I accomplish it that day or not, it's up to me to get in His Word and His will and find out where I'm supposed to be and do it. But um, thank God, brother. Amen. That's good. Has he been like that his whole life? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. I appreciate this. Yeah, it did help. Long time ago, wasn't it, brother? Amen. Amen. I appreciate the kind words he said about me. I uh, uh, hate that he would talk so nice about me, and I'm going to preach like I'm getting ready to preach. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but uh, I told you, I told you this morning that the Lord didn't change my heart that this is where we'd be tonight, and I feel that this is appropriate. Um, I shared with you this morning to be praying. Um, most of you know that uh, we now have a liquor store here in uh, in in uh, Polk County, and that's something that I honestly never thought I'd see. And um, I have found out since then that there have been some people that I care about who um, are not directly tied into this, but have gotten hurt by others who feel it's right to take out their frustrations on innocent people. And that's never a good thing. No. So let me pray for a pre preface, I guess. What I'm going to say tonight, that my intentions tonight is not to hurt any living soul. I want to hurt the devil. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, as he shared just a minute ago, I just like to sock it to him. Amen. Um, Amen. I feel like tonight that um, the church has been deceived over the years by something that we used to know was not good. We used to know was something we should avoid, but... Um, Today it seems like that people aren't so sure anymore and there's debates and anytime we debate the word of God, you're going to end up wrong because he's always right. Amen. But um, tonight I want to preach on the most dangerous drug in America, the most dangerous drug in America. And if I was to ask you what you thought that was, you might, if you hadn't known already, if you were here this morning, you know what I'm going to talk about. But um, if you weren't here this morning, you might guess maybe it was, you know, the methamphetamine, that's bad. Prescription drugs, that's bad. Marijuana, that's bad. Believe it or not, it's bad. It's legal in some states now, but them states, God help them, we need to pray for them. Uh, they're, they don't know what they're doing. But the most dangerous drug I believe in America is dealt with in the book of Proverbs. So turn with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 20. And I'll ask you to hold your spot there. We're going to read one verse, then we're going to flip over three chapters. Proverbs chapter 20. And then Proverbs chapter 23 is where we'll take our text from tonight. And then we'll proceed on from there. The most dangerous drug in America. And I say it this way because it's affected quite possibly every single person or family in this church. And uh, my heart goes out to you. It has affected my family, which um, some of the effects of it are still being felt today. But we need to know what God's word says. And again, my intention tonight is not to hurt anyone. If you get upset, get upset with God. Or you can get upset with me. But I want you to understand what the Bible says. In Proverbs chapter 20, the first verse, and then we're going to flip over two chapters, or three rather, and read a few verses there. But if you've got Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, say amen. The Bible says that wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And in chapter 23, I'm going to begin reading with verse 29. 
through the remainder of that chapter. The 23rd chapter of Proverbs, verse 29 says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrows? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Look now, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. My Father, I stand in your presence tonight ever thankful, but Lord, very humble to understand my unworthiness to do so. I pray, God, tonight that your will would be done. Father, I pray that you will, your word would be heard, your spirit be felt. Use me, Father, as your messenger and nothing more. And God, let me not speak opinions, but God, let me stay with your word as we see it and I understand it through the teachings of your spirit. Now, Father, I pray tonight that you'll help us to see through what has been presented to us in society and in the world. And God, if there's one here, as the man said a few minutes ago, if there's one here that is lost, I pray they'll come to Christ, Father, before it is too late. Now, Father, we sure do love you and we thank you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Be seated. I'm going to deal with alcohol tonight with the hopes of helping us understand more about this subject and what the Bible says. There was an old baseball player who was saved in Chicago a long, long, long time ago uh, by the name of Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday was a little short, fiery preacher. Billy Sunday was saved sitting on the sidewalks there in Chicago, drunk, leaned up against the pole, and he could hear a tent meeting and the gospel being preached just over the way. And through the different chain of events, he became saved. And he began to understand the hold that alcohol had on his life. And if you want to look up preaching on alcohol, if you can find some of Billy Sunday's recordings which are out there, that man, he got fired up. Uh, a gentleman was talking about taking a fit. Billy Sunday would literally climb up on top of pulpits and scream and holler and throw his clothes and trying to get his point across on how dangerous this thing was. And for a while, I think we listened. There was a time in this country where we had what was called prohibition. Now most teachers and historians look at prohibition as a, a black stain on America, that it's something we shouldn't have done. In my opinion, it's one of the best things we ever did. Didn't last very long. And now we've come to an age today where alcohol is everywhere. And some people may not agree with me tonight, and that's okay. Um, I want to agree with God, and I hope that you'll want to agree with God. And if the way that we want to live goes against the way that the Bible tells us to live, then it would behoove us all to get with the way God wants us to live. Now, I don't stand up here perfect. I don't stand up here condemning anybody. And again, my goal tonight is not to down anybody or hurt anybody. We're all flawed. But in the church of the Lord today, there are many opinions concerning alcohol. Some people say you ought to be what they used to call teetotalers, where you don't do anything at all with it. Well, there's some that say you can have it, but the key is moderation. And then there's other branches of the church that say, have fun, just don't get killed. Yeah. Or some of them, I guess, don't care if you get killed as long as you put enough money in the box, you know, oh. whatever they do. Amen. But what does the Bible have to say? Now, the thing about alcohol, the reason I say it's so dangerous compared to any other drug, and a drug is something that alters your mental state. I don't care what you tell me, alcohol alters your mental state. Amen. And therefore, to me, it's a drug. It's yeah. accepted everywhere. You can buy this stuff. You can buy it anywhere. Now we can buy it in our county. And my heart breaks for that. The people that have opened that store, I don't know why they did it. Um, I'm assuming money had a lot to do with it. There's a lot of money in the alcohol business. <clears throat> but there have been so many people, including Christians, who have just praised this and said, oh, it's great. We have accepted it. And that's dangerous. It's availability. You go to any restaurant today and you sit down, one of the first things they're going to ask you is, would you like a drink? Would you like a margarita? Would you like a, a beer? Would you like a glass of this or that? And one preacher said, would you like a drink? He, and the preacher said, no, I got a drink about 30 years ago and I've been satisfied ever since. <laughs> Let me tell you about that. 
But it's availability. It's everywhere. You can walk into every gas station, and now we've got this store. Now it's going to be more prevalent everywhere we go. It's everywhere. And my friends, if we don't understand what it is really about, what the Word says, what it can do, if you came from a home where alcohol was an issue, you should very quickly yes. line up, I believe, yes. with what you'll hear tonight. Yes. Because I've never met somebody who was saying, I just thank God for my alcoholic parents. Yes. I thank God that I had a drunk daddy yeah. that stayed out three days, that beat my mama. Yeah. I thank God for a mama who stayed drunk, didn't take care of us. We had to change ourselves. We had to shower ourselves. We had to feed ourselves at three and four year old. I've met people with that testimony, by the way. But I've never heard anybody say, oh, that's just great. What a life. <laughs> what, what a life that was. My friend, alcohol has ruined more families, more marriages, more family relationships, more careers. It's destroying our world. And let's not be deceived. Let's see what the Word says. Yes. Now, let's talk about this tonight. Now, I want you to notice something. If you go back to Proverbs 23, kind of keep your uh, fingers there. We're going to deal primarily in the 23rd chapter. But if you look at verse 31, I want you to see this. It says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Now, that phrase, moveth itself aright, is telling us or is the indication of fermented wine. Now, we know that the Bible has different words it's given for wine. Some of them alcoholic, some of them non-alcoholic. And there's where your debates begin to come in. Well, Jesus did this, so-and-so did that. People say, well, Jesus gave wine at the Lord's Supper. Jesus turned water into wine. Timothy was told, have a little wine. The key preacher is moderation. And I will disagree with you there. I don't believe that. Uh, and I'll show you why. I'll try to give you as much as I can tonight without preaching until Monday. Uh, <laughs> but if we preach very long, we'll, we'll finish some snacks and we'll just keep going. Amen? But let me tell you my position first of all. I believe that the position of a Christian and the position of this church, as I'm the pastor of this church, and you get another pastor, he's got another opinion, that's on him. But I get my opinion while I'm the pastor. Amen? Amen. And my position is total abstinence. Teetotaler, yes. stay away from yes. it. And I'm going to show you more why in just a minute. Yes. Now let me give you a few things here that I see. Now if you'll go back to Proverbs chapter 20, I want to give you some of this first. This is going to be a lot of information. If you take notes, this is your night. If you're not good at taking notes, we are recording this. you got CDs you can get. It'll be on the uh, YouTube church thing. You can go back and watch it later. But folks, I'm telling you, I hope this will help you tonight. But in Proverbs chapter 20, in verse number 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, and here's a word, strong drink. That is a word that we see used, and that is a word in the Hebrew called shakar. Shakar, I mean, it's strong drink. And as you read through the Bible, you will find that strong drink is universally condemned all throughout the Bible, except for Proverbs chapter 31, where it talks about giving shakar to someone who is dying, giving strong drink to someone who is leaving this world. It's an idea of a medication or a narcotic. It's somebody who is suffering in their final days and in a lot of pain. And the Bible says use shakar to help ease their pain to help them as they are dying. Everywhere else in the Bible that you see that word shakar or strong drink, it is universally uh, condemned in the Bible. Now, there's another word given that uh, we'll find in the, in the Bible. It's called triage. Triosh. Triosh in the Hebrew means new wine, or it's also sometimes used as wine. You'll see wine and new wine. Triosh is a word that, as we look at it, it's, it, it's juice that is either fresh from the grape, or even I'm thinking Proverbs 4 it talks about juice that is still in the grape. That word triosh is used. So sometimes wine is referred to as wine that is still within the grape. That's wine too. Has this idea of what we understand today to be essentially grape juice. This was a very prominent drink in those days. They harvested grapes and they would keep uh, these grapes and they would drink this. And this was one of their primary drinks that they had. Now here's where it starts to come in that we start to have a debate. And uh, well, what about, uh, did they drink new wine, grape juice as we understand it to be, or did they drink fermented wine? Well, Dr. Driver was a Hebrew scholar back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a brilliant man did a lot of research and studies on Jewish cultures and customs. And he helped us understand that the Jews in those days would harvest the grapes, they would have grape juice, 
and they had a process by which they would uh, check fermentation levels and they would watch it and when it got to be to a certain point they would do what they had to do with it but they would drink it and it would be what we would consider today almost like a uh, or what they called in that day a light wine but in today like a strong grape juice now fermentation was something they had to watch they did check it in those days but another study that came out of Yale University on alcoholism said that natural grape juice left to ferment on its own can only ferment itself to a certain point. It cannot eclipse the point of making one drunk without being mechanically altered. Amen. What's all that mean? Well, it's got to have something else put into it. And if you're familiar with the brewing art, you know yeast, sometimes pure grain alcohol or other things are added to your wines and your liquors to make them alcoholic. And what that study at Yale said, now these are people that weren't necessarily Christians, but they were looking at the fact of can this stuff turn into this stuff by itself. It would ferment, it would have a content of it, but not enough to make one drunk. So the argument that goes back and says, well, they just drunk, everybody drunk alcoholic wine in those days doesn't match up. We have resources and historians and scholars from those days that said that they did drink uh, the juice and that uh, they would actually have a process by which they would check it as it fermented so they could drink it or move it or whatever they had to do to it. So that word triage, that word new wine, is what we understand to be grape juice. Well, there's another word. Now, there are some words in the Bible that deals with wine that have a dual meaning. They can mean a wine that makes one intoxicated or also a wine that doesn't make one intoxicated. It can mean either one. Now, here's where you can get confused with this because sometimes the only way you can tell is to take in context. Now, one of the words we find is the word yaya. And that, that's found here in chapter 20. It's, it's a word that means it either intoxicates or it doesn't intoxicate. It's the, most, it's the most used word for wine that we find in the Bible. Now here's where it starts to get sketchy. People say, well, why don't the Bible just say what it means? <laughs> if it means drunk wine, say drunk wine. If it means grape juice, say grape juice, preacher. You're making this up. No, I'm not. But let me ask you a question. If me and Peggy we're driving home to her house. She was going to let me come over and straighten Jack out. And we drove by the Sonic, and I said, or we were headed towards Benton, and I said, hey, Peggy, how did I stop and get a drink? More than likely, hopefully, Peggy would think Coca-Cola <laughs> or, or water. And we'd stop at the Sonic or wherever, and we'd get us a Coca-Cola or a milkshake, half price after 8 o'clock. Amen. You're welcome, Sonic. Appreciate that. But when I'd say that, but you take two people who are alcoholics and they're driving home, one of them says, hey, let's stop and get a drink. Yeah. It's going to mean something completely different uh, for them. Right. So you see in the word, when these words are used, we can't just look at it and say, well, it's the word of wine. And as I understand wine, this is what he's saying. So this is what it is. You have to look at it. And there's a lot more that goes into it. But let's keep going. I, I, I don't want to overload you tonight. But if I do, that'd be all right. We'll let God sort this out in our minds. But I want to give these things to you because I think it will help you. In the New Testament, the word, the Greek word used for wine is oinus, if I said that right. It means exactly the same thing as y'all. And it can mean either alcoholic or non-alcoholic. You have to look at the context to see which one it is. Now, if it's talking about, like we see in Proverbs, staying away from it, then we can understand what that means. But what do we do with the Jesus part, right? What do we do with Jesus turning water into wine? What do we do with Jesus um, taking wine, or what we believe was wine, at the Last Supper? What do we do with Paul telling Timothy to have a little wine? Well, let me help you understand. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, we understand, is taking bread. Now, what kind of bread do we take? Anybody know? It's called unleavened bread. Passover. <coughs> It's with unleavened bread means what? Without leaven. Yeast. Exactly. The yeast is what makes the leaven. It's unleavened. And yeast in the Bible is a symbolism of sin. So at the Passover time, they said, don't put leaven in the bread. We're getting sin out. And this is going to be the celebration of the Passover. Now, would he say get the yeast, the fermentation out of the bread, but yet let it be in the wine? 
Think about it for a minute. Would Jesus say, this is a specific bread we've got to have, but the wine, we can, we can have yeast in it, because that's what it took. It takes yeast to make the fermentation. It's got to be modified to the point of making one drunk, and they didn't know how to do that. Believe me, they knew how to make it strong and intoxicating. Don't, don't think that they didn't for a second. But at the Lord's Supper, leaven, being a symbol of sin, was commanded not to be in the bread. You think it was in the wine that they drank? We've got to understand that that wine, that yayin, that oiliness, was juice. Now, was it exactly the Welch's that we pull off the shelf at the store? Probably not. No. I love the taste of that stuff. But I'll tell you, if you drink more than what comes in these little cups, it's rough on you. <laughs> it's rough on me anyway. <laughs> it's tough. When I drink it in this little cup, I'm like, man, I'm going to go get me a jug of that on the way home. And I pour a glass, and that just don't work, brother. It just is it's no. too stout for me. I can't, uh, I can't do it. But we go on, and, and, and priests in the Bible were forbidden to take a strong drink in wine. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is our high priest. You think Jesus went to that wedding with the intentions on making them all drunk? We've got to use our heads. We've got to think about this. Now, these words, but we've got to understand what they mean. Habakkuk 2, verse 15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink that put us the bottle to him. Is Jesus going to go against the Old Testament? Don't you think Jesus knew what the Bible said there? Don't you think Jesus knew the words of Solomon? To not look at the wine when it's red, when it has become fermented, when it moved itself aright. He understood what that said. But yet so many today think that Jesus threw a keg party at that wedding feast at Cana. I had the, the great privilege to preach in Cana when I got to go over there. And uh, I had fun with this. And my guide, our tour guide in Israel, um, nice kid, thought a lot of him, but he liked to consume alcohol. We didn't know that at the time. He never drank while we were there, but after we got back, it was social media, we got to see he did do that. But while I was there, <laughs> I let it fly, boy. I let it fly right there in the middle of those. The Catholics had built two churches right there in the middle of Cana, and it's commemorating the wedding, the wedding feast, and Jesus turned the water into wine. And I preached similar to what I'm preaching today, that God did not have a big throw-up, throw-out drunk party when he turned that water around. They said, we've never tasted wine like this. My friend, let me tell you, Jesus wasn't making rotten fruit juice. No. By the way, the blood of the Lord's Supper, that's what the wine is symbolic of. Yes. When we take of the yes. cup, it is symbolic yes. of the blood of the cup of the New Testament. Are you going to tell me that rotten fermented juice is a symbol of my Savior's blood? You're not going to convince me of that, friend. I believe that this word teaches that there are stuff that is intoxicating, that we're to stay away from, and there's those that we can partake of that are not intoxicating. Yes. Okay? Now, to go back and look at chapter 29. Let's just go through this and take a look at this, and I want to show you some of this, okay? <laughs> talking about strong drink. Talking about uh, wine being a mocker in chapter um, 23. Or chapter 23 and uh, verse 29. Now, this is all talking about alcohol. He says, who hath woe? Who hath sorrows? How many people have lived a sorrow-filled life because of alcohol? How many in this church are hurting as I'm talking about this because it hits home to you? Now, let me share something with you. God knows that hurt. God knows that pain. God did not intend for us to do what we have done with what he has given us. Man can take the good things of God and find a way to make a sin out of it very quickly. And we've done that. Who has sorrows? Who's he talking about? People who are addicted to the bottle. People who are addicted to alcohol. They have sorrow. Not only that, but he says, who has contentions? Who's a brawler? Who has anger? Who has altercations? Who's quick to fight? You ever seen somebody, as they say, 10 feet tall? And bulletproof. What happens there? Well, you get a little liquid courage in you, and you'll take on anybody. You're a brawler, some people are. Contentions. How many people have woken up with bruises and bumps that weren't there before they did it? But they brought contention to it. Uh, keep on reading. Who hath babblings? You ever heard a drunk go on? Yeah. If we're not careful, we'll laugh at them. Mm -hmm. If we'll laugh at them. But can I tell you, it's a very pitiful thing because they have lost control. They have been altered to the place to where they're not themselves. 
their control of their, uh, their faculties, their speech, their, their filters, if you will, are gone. And they're just rambling and babbling and, and just saying all kinds of things off the wall. Friends, that's what alcohol will do. You'll end up saying stuff, doing stuff. You'll make a fool out of yourself. Folks, we've got to watch that. Who hath wounds without cause? We just talked about that. We get drunk and fall over the place. Can I tell you a story? I heard this story about um, a preacher traveling somewhere near his home. And he come up on a real bad wreck. And he got out of the car. And this one car was just bad and the officers there knew the preacher and they said brother so-and-so this is bad we just had to remove this lady she uh, she died and uh, they began to go on what happened is the other gentleman that had hit her was drunk and it ran through a stop sign red light whatever and hit this woman and killed her probably on her way home see her kids you know he, she died and the cop went to the guy in the car who had no injuries because he was drunk and told him sir you know what you've done you hit another woman you've killed her she's dead we just had to call her family and you know what this guy said please excuse what I'm about to say but I'm just quoting please excuse me he said this verbatim I don't give a damn mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he looked that officer right in the face yeah. after being told what he just did he said I don't give a damn Oh, let's praise alcohol, yeah. the new God of America. Oh, we've got a liquor store in Ben. Praise God for revenue. Praise God for liquor stores. You go and find a family that's lost a loved one to a drunk driver. Yeah. You tell them how they feel. You go, ahead, you go find a kid who had a mother or father, Amen. alcoholic, that they didn't have a relationship with or had a bad. You ask them what they think about it. Heard another story of a boy one time. Didn't grow up in an alcoholic family, but he said, I made up my mind as a kid. I'll never drink alcohol. He said he's outside one time and saw a man who was drunk, stumbling, stammering all over the place. He didn't put his car in park, and the car started to roll. Well, the man's trying to get back in the car, and he said, I've never seen anything like that. He said, this man trying to get in the car, he kept slamming the door, trying to shut it, and it wouldn't shut. Didn't realize his leg was hanging out of the door. Slamming it on his, <laughs> he slammed it on his leg. Watching the car roll down. And he watched that and he said, I'll never act like that. How stupid. How ignorant to look and to act like that. All because of the God of alcohol. Liquid formaldehyde, all that stuff is. Now, keep on reading. Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, and they that go to seek the mixed wine. Look thou not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself awry. Notice this. You ever notice the, the advertisements for alcohol, how glorious they are? Oh, yeah. I mean, Budweiser spends. What's the Super Bowl ad? $30 million for an ad at the Super Bowl. And they've got these majestic Clydesdale horses running through a snow-covered field. And Man, life's good. Drink up, have fun, everything's perfect with the world. They never show the downside of alcohol. Preacher one time at his church, he lived in a town where there was a brewery. And he had the sign made and he put it in his church and it was a sign of a man in the side street laid up against the gutter with a bottle in his hand, drunk with rats all around him in filth. And the sign said, the effects of alcohol. And apparently this company had a slogan that says in their glorious advertisements, the benefits of alcohol. And he was showing them what they wouldn't show. And he said, the guy called and said, Preacher, I want to have a meeting with you. He said, I'll meet you in 10 minutes. So they met. He said, Preacher, that sign in your church is against what we're doing. It's hurting. I don't like that. I want you, we want you to take that sign down. And that preacher said, no, I'll not do it. And that guy threatened to take him to court and said, we'll take you to court. He said, take me to court. <laughs> he said, how dare you? He said, you have your televisions, your magazines, your TV shows, Everything out there advertising your alcohol, how wonderful and how glorious it is, all the benefits of it. I put one little sign in my parking lot telling people what it really looks like. Yeah. Are you going to come sue me? He said, I'll tell you this, if you'll take your signs down, I'll take mine down. <laughs> right. 
And of course, they wasn't going to go with that. But my friend, we've looked at this, and in America, we have looked at this, and we said, oh, the Bible says it's okay for us to do that. My friend, the Bible says you stay away from this stuff. Because when you get a hold of this stuff, my friend, it'll get a hold of you. The Chinese have a proverb that says, first, the man has a drink. Then the drink has a drink. And then the drink has the man. Now let me show you this. At the last alcohol, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Adder is one of the most poisonous snakes in the world. You know what you're doing when you're ingesting this stuff? You're poisoning yourself. You're literally putting a poison in you that could kill you. But we do it anyway. And to be that all, we have begun to glorify. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. How many families have been destroyed in the, in the altar of alcohol? Mm -hmm. Thine heart shall utter or seek perverse things. You see, the thing when you drink, you lose something. Yeah. You lose what we call inhibition. The thing that tells you don't do that. Yeah. The thing that says... That's not a good idea. You go out and buy a new car. <laughs> if you're like some of us, hillbilly boys, we might get a hanker and see how fast that car will go. But something in us will say, nah, <laughs> I'll get a ticket. I might get have a wreck. You know, Something might happen. You get a few drops of liquid courage in you, and it turns off that inhibition. You'll get in that car and see how fast it will go. Sure. They say for every shot of alcohol, your depth perception changes by six feet. You ever wonder who's driving home from the restaurants and everybody's drinking? You ever been to a ball game and seen everybody drinking and wonder who's driving home with that family? You ever look over to table three away and both of them is drinking and you wonder who's driving who home? Well, preacher, that's their business. You stay out of their business. What they do is their business. If my kids yeah. are within six feet of that inebriated person, it's my business. You got that. If my family is in depth of that <coughs> depth inebriated person, Amen. then it's my business. Amen. The Bible says no man lives to himself. No man's going to die to himself. Everything has a consequence. We don't realize the lie we've been sold, that this stuff is okay, that it's not going to hurt you. Now not, now, not everybody that drinks is going to turn into an alcoholic. But how can you tell? <laughs> how can you tell? Does the Bible say, well, be careful? As we see the Bible, and as it talks about strong drink, and it talks about intoxicating beverage, every time we see it, either it's in plain or it's in context, stay away from that mess. Yeah. By the way, let me share this with you. Jesus dying on the cross. Y'all remember that? Yeah. It's kind of important. <laughs> yeah. he, he died on the cross. In the book of Mark, it says they tried to give him something. Remember what they tried to give him? Wine mixed with myrrh. Strong drink. Intoxicating alcohol. Why did they do that? Because it was dying. Remember I told you. In Proverbs it says when somebody's dying to give that to them to dead in the pain to help them with their suffering. The same Jesus that supposedly turned water into a big shindig at the wedding. The same Jesus that had a drunk fest before he went to the cross with his disciples stood on a cross when that was offered to him and the word says he did what? He rejected it. He turned his head telling all of us don't let that foul junk in your body even if it means you die. <laughs> even if it means you suffer a little bit don't let that junk in your body. Later on they offered him another sponge. Remember what was on that one? Vinegar. He took that one. Why? Because he could. The word said for the priest to stay away from alcohol, not to drink it. And Jesus was true unto his death as our high priest to stay away from that junk. Yeah. Are you going to tell me he's encouraging us to do it? My friend, we're mistaken. We are mistaken. Let's keep looking a little further right here. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Drunken sailors, if you will. Foolishness. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. <laughs> they have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? You know what he's saying? Where did all these bruises come from? <laughs> Where did this cut on my arm come from? 
Man, I woke up with a terrible headache. I felt like somebody beat me in my head. What's this bruise on my knee? Why is my coffee table busted? Why is this broken? What's wrong with all this? You didn't know? Man, you were stumbling all over the place last night. You got a hold of your stuff. And you were just acting crazy out of your mind. You fell. Got called to the jail one night. Young man they had brought in who I knew, who had been there two days and didn't know it. Didn't know it. He woke up there, had no idea how he got there, was covered in blood, had no idea whose blood it was. He woke up, leaned against the wall of his cell in his uh, jail cell. He come to his senses, leaned up against it, had no, they had to tell him what happened. He got drunk, much liquor as he'd get his hands on. Then he started taking some pills. Fell off the porch, cut himself, broke his nose, tried to get in a fight with a family member. It was a bloody mess and was literally unconscious while awake for two days. They won't put him on a commercial. You'll not find him in a jail cell covered in blood, not knowing where the last two days of his life been, and say, drink up. Enjoy yourself, I am. My, how we've been fooled. Friend, listen, there is no glory in alcohol. There is no glory in alcohol. It is one of the most destructive substances this world has ever known. And if you don't believe me, just ask somebody sitting close to you. They can tell you. Folks, listen to me. That stuff, we cannot as a church get to the place to where we think these things are okay. Look at what he says in verse 35. After all this, they have stricken me. Shall thou say I was not sick? They have beat me and I felt it not. When shall I awake? What's he going to do when he gets awake? I'll seek it again. Addiction. You going to tell me alcohol is not addictive? Argue with that. You can argue with me. But you'll never convince me You'll never convince me that my sweet Jesus encouraged drunkenness, alcoholic beverage intake of any kind. Not just talking about the liquor store. I'm talking about beer too. Beer is just as bad. Just have to drink a little more. My Jesus did not do that. I believe they drank wine at that wedding, but I believe it was the precious, sweetest tasting. Jews they had ever had in their life. There wasn't no leaven in that. There wasn't no yeast in that. There wasn't no pure alcohol in that to convert it, to mechanically change it. You had to remember, you had to modify it to make it where it would even get you drunk. They don't just stick, they don't stomp the grape stick in the barrel and it turns into wine. If you anybody should know, they have to put stuff in it to make it that way. Jesus, when he turned that water into wine, made some of the most tremendous juice they had ever had. When Jesus sat down with that uh, the, the, uh, the Lord's Supper and he had that cup or bowl, whatever he had, and he poured that out, he says, this boys is the blood of the new covenant. Remember the first time you tried alcohol? Yes, sir. What did you do? More than likely you did something like this. <coughs> Do you think Jesus handed that around at the Lord's Supper? He says, boys, this is the blood of the covenant. This is my blood in the cup. I'd have to say, Jesus, I can't swap it. Jesus, I, that's too strong. No, that's not my kind of Jesus. When Paul gave Timothy advice on how to make it through his ministry, he said, Timothy, a lot of stress in this. You're going to have ailments. When your stomach starts to bother you, get your fifth, sit down, drink your troubles away. You think that's what he meant? What if somebody come knocking at Timothy's house that night needing help? Come on in, friend. Timothy, what's wrong, Timothy? What's wrong? Amen. Oh, just trying to fix a little belly ache. Boys, what can I do for you? Use your God-given sense. 
friend. Don't be deceived. Those who are deceived are not wise. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived is not wise. Listen to me, church. I'm not saying go protest, burn down their building, shun those people. Don't do that. As Christians, you don't do that. That's already starting to happen. Okay? It's already starting to happen. I'm being told this. Don't be like that. You pray. Best thing you can do is pray. That's right. You ain't got to go down there and shop. Hope you don't. Don't go down there and shop. Don't support that stuff. If somebody asks you, you tell them, look, I don't agree with it. I believe the Bible says we ought to stay away from that stuff. My friend, the people that are addicted to it, can I tell you the best thing to do for them? Point them to Jesus. Being addicted to alcohol is no different than being addicted to drugs, gambling, or any other vice on this earth. Addiction is an addiction. And they all have one cure. And that cure is Jesus. Amen. Whatever it is. But listen, as a church, as a Christian, let's not glorify this stuff. Amen. Because if we glorify it, we have all but helped write the names of the dead in their tombstones. That's right. I don't want to see another one lost to drunk driving. I don't want to see another one lost to an alcoholic abusive home. Can I tell you about a family member of mine real briefly? The effects of this are still in play today. This has been 22, 23 years this happened. A relationship where the man drunk beer. I preach everybody in Tennessee drinks beer. This man drunk beer. He didn't drink liquor. Couldn't buy it around here then. He drunk beer. And he was an alcoholic. Now he didn't, I don't know how much he drunk, but he, he drank a lot. And this family member just kind of looked over it, you know. It's just, uh, boys will be boys. After all, it's hillbillies, we all drink moonshine anyway, don't we? One day, the wife ends up in a ditch, had been thrown through two barbed wire fences. Three ribs broken, her face beaten to a pulp, hit with numerous objects, and thrown in a ditch to die by her husband. All because of alcohol. He got drunk. She didn't cook something the way he liked it. And she almost died. Thank God mama lived, though. <laughs> he didn't do that. Not my daddy. This was something else totally different. But mama, mama lived through that. But I saw my mama with her face deformed. Charlotte, you remember that. You know who I'm talking about. But I saw my mama like that. I never want to kill somebody so bad in my life. That's right. How dare you? My mama ain't no saint. <laughs> I love my mama. She ain't no saint. Nobody deserves that. Mm. He beat her and left her for dead in a ditch mm. in a house less than a mile from where I now currently live. Every time I drive by that house, I think of that. It's a towing shop now. Every time I drive by that house, I see that ditch and I think of my mama laying in that ditch, almost dead, and had it not been for somebody that sent her, she might have laid there, beat it and blooded and broken, and him beat her literally to death. That's what I think about. So when my time came to try alcohol, well, I thought, yeah, man, I'm going to be like my friends. God gave me a gag reflex. Can I tell you, I can eat anything and anywhere. Well, I can't eat it. I'm a picky eater. But I, have, I don't have a queasy stomach. You can perform surgery and I'll sit down and eat a sandwich while you're doing it. Don't bother me. I mean, I can handle it. But can I tell you, when I was a kid, we was down fishing at the creek, down from the house. I pulled up a beer bottle, and I was going to throw it and bust it on the rocks. I turned that thing up, and I poured that beer on me. <laughs> I ain't never smelt nothing like that in my life. And I went home, 
And you remember, Mom thought I'd been drinking. <laughs> he said, you smell like beer. I said, Mama, I know it. I pulled this beer bottle up, and I went to throw it, and I poured it all over me. You, you think she believed that? No. <laughs> no. I was covered in this junk. I was, <clears throat> I mean, oh, so bad. First time I ever tried liquor. I like to die. <laughs> I made a little sip. <coughs> what in the world? This is propane. What is this? This is nasty. I thought, man, if I've got to drink that to get drunk, forget it. But that was my story. I believe I was very fortunate. Because there's a lot of people in this church right now that fought the battle of the bottle. Yeah. Some of you won it. Some of you still fighting it. Some of you got mamas and daddies who never won it. Let me tell you something. God is greater. God is bigger than the bottle. My Lord Jesus is better than any drunk there is. My friends, you can get snookered and wasted out of your mind to forget your troubles, but guess what? When the alcohol wears off, the problems are still there. You're going to drown your problems? Fine. But let me tell you something, friend. They'll float. Listen to me. The only hope we have is the Lord Jesus. Let's turn to Him. Do not be deceived by this. Don't go around thinking, oh, preacher, it's fine. Oh, preacher, it's, it's a, you know, long, we can do that. There's nothing wrong with it as long as we're careful. Listen to me. Don't you get drawn into that trap. You know how many people said, this little bit of crack won't hurt me. I know people who took heroin the first time and they died. The first time took crack. I don't even know what crack is. I know it's a drug. I couldn't, if I had it here, I couldn't tell you what it was. First time they took it, it killed them. I know people that went out with some buddies, had their first drinks of alcohol, and tried to drive home, and never made it. Friend, listen to me. If you're going to play with the devil, you better be ready for the consequences. My friend, let's get in the Word and see what it says. Don't get fooled. Don't be deceived. And if you've got family or friends or if you're struggling with that, let me tell you something. Jesus is the only hope we have. Any addiction, alcohol, one, the rest of it, any of it, everything in this life, the only hope, the only answer is Jesus. Turn it over to him and say, Lord Jesus, change me. Change this. Change that. Take this away. Help me. Because at the end, that stuff bites like a serpent. Kill you. It will. My friend Jesus said, I've come yet you have life. Let's live through Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together all around the church tonight.